Hello, I'm Sergeant First Class Scott Vincent, and welcome to the timpani portion of this video. In this section, we'll cover basic fundamental techniques and quite a few advanced techniques. You'll gain a comprehensive knowledge of how to play the timpani with a good quality tone and a full understanding of how and why the timpani work, mechanically speaking. I'll begin by saying that all too often, the timpani are conceived to be a loud and bombastic instrument with limited musical capabilities. Consider the history of the timpani in the settings of the early symphony. The timpani were, of course, utilized in a very rhythmical sense with wood mallets being the most commonly used. Not much tone is compared with the modern timpani sound. The progression of sound of the modern day timpani has led us to a much warmer and resonant tone. As you watch this video, I hope that you, the student or teacher, will gain a much better appreciation of the musical possibilities of the timpani. Let's begin by assuming, as in the keyboard section of this video, that you can already read in bass clef. The first thing I would like to discuss is probably the most basic, yet the most ignored fundamental, the general setup of the timpani. First, in a basic set of timpani, there are four drums ranging in size from 32 inches to 23 inches in diameter. That's the most basic set, 32 inch, 29 inch, 26 inch, and 23 inches. The largest of the drums will be on the player's left, and the smallest will be on the player's right. Now set your body in position behind the two middle timpani, the 29 and the 26 inch, in such a way that you're most comfortable. Now with your eyes closed, move your right hand over to a comfortable playing position where the top drum would be. Open your eyes, and without removing your right hand from this position, pull the 23 inch drum into position. Now do the same thing for the 32 inch. And that's basically it. Now that you've got the timpani into position and ready to play, let's discuss the body position. And this is the section of the video where you may need to be most flexible in your thinking. Simply put, are you tall, short, or medium height. Either way, I recommend the sitting position. Now I sit all of the time. Actually, it's more like resting on the edge of, say, a 32 inch high stool. Now, by choosing to sit, there are quite a few advantages. First, it's more comfortable for a tall person to approach the timpani from this angle, as opposed to, say, this angle. Not to mention much better for the back. And second, sitting for anyone will allow you to facilitate pedaling changes much easier. Now you'll find that modern day writing for timpani requires many fast pitch changes, sometimes while simultaneously playing on another drum. And so for this reason, I sit. Now for those who choose to stand, I can only guess it's because they're vertically challenged. And I'll bet you when they play something that requires a lot of pedaling, they use a stool, which in turn proves my point. Sitting is the way to go. Now that we've got the drums into position and we're in a comfortable seated or standing position, let's discuss the grip. Basically, we've got three choices here, German, French, and the in-between stroke, American. A typical German-style timpani grip will look somewhat similar to the snare drum grip, however, have a little less pressure applied from the back fingers. The palm should face the floor, and the fulcrum or pressure point will be between the thumb and the first or second joints of the index finger. There's also a similarity of wrist action to the snare drum stroke, typically a downward motion with that distinctive timpani lift. The nature of this grip is to provide a strong, weighty sound that'll cut through just about any size ensemble. Next, there's the French grip. With the fulcrum in the same place as the German grip, turn the hands outward about 90 degrees until the thumbs are facing upwards. This grip allows for a more light-handed stroke, allowing the sound to be drawn out of the head. Now everything in between these two grips is sort of an adaptation called the American grip. And I would say that this is probably the most commonly used grip. It's a good combination of a downward and upward motion, allowing for optimum lift and a quality resonant tone. 
Now from the German grip, rotate your hands outward about 45 degrees instead of 90 degrees, as in the French grip. And that's it. Now you're probably wondering, what grip do I use? Well, I use all three. It all depends on what's called for in the music. What's the style? How thick is the orchestration? What type of ensemble am I supporting? Or even, what type of venue am I playing? Now I'll get into more specifics later in the video when I cover mallet selection. Now let's take a look at the position of the mallet on the head. In the down position, the mallet should be parallel to the playing surface, and the playing area should be approximately three inches from the rim, or roughly one quarter the distance from the center of the drum. If you're not good with math, draw an imaginary line through the middle of the head, then again through that distance, and once more, there's your beating spot. Also, try to pick an area directly in between two tension rods. I tend to find that the drum is more resonant in between rods as opposed to in line with one especially if the drum is out of clear. By out of clear, I mean when one or more tuning spots is not identical in tension. I guess in a perfect world, when the head is absolutely in tune, it may not matter. Before we get into stroke, let's discuss the different mallet types. There are two basic types, cartwheel and ball. Now the cartwheel from a top view looks sort of like a wheel and is nothing more than a piece of felt wrapped around a core and sewn together on the outside. The advantage, it's easier to wrap. Disadvantage, the seam is visible and audible. Now the ball stick is basically a parachute piece of felt laid over the core with the seam drawn around the shaft. Now the advantage, the seam is hidden and it lasts longer because of the ever-changing impact spots. Now the disadvantage, it's harder to wrap. Now, since most of you watching this video won't end up wrapping your own mallets, I suggest using the ball type. Now those of you who opt for the cartwheel wrap, try marking the seam of the mallet with a black felt pen. This will make it easier to spot the seam, which you don't want to hit on, because you'll hear a ticking sound. Now, I would like to at some point get into the different types of shafts, but I think I'll tackle that later in the section on mallet selection. Let's now get into the real guts of this session, technique. If you haven't viewed the logistical section, it might be a good idea to look at the section on grip and playing area. I'd like to describe a good timpani stroke as one similar to a tennis ball rebounding from a downward toss. And with the mallets in a perpendicular position to the ground, strike the head, imagining that tennis ball rebound. Now you can achieve this by lifting the mallets high off the head immediately after impact, drawing the sound out. The technique just described is a very basic, general description of a proper timpani stroke. Within this, there are a few varieties that can really complement your arsenal of sounds. Uh, for legato sound, just leave the mallet on the head a little longer. And what you're after is a sound which is darker and more resonant, really pulling the sound deep from out of the drum, rather than that hard surface sound. Now for staccato, or more articulate sound, lift the mallet sooner. Now this would be a legato stroke which really pulls the sound out of the drum. Just a nice slow motion to and from the head. Now this would be a staccato stroke. Same speed exercise, just quicker motions off the head. 